Well, good morning and uh, welcome back to Cross Community Church. Uh, I'm glad to be back with you. I, I was on the mission trip to West Virginia the, the prior week and last week I was exhausted and you wouldn't have wanted to listen to me preach. So I'm glad to get to be back with you today. This is the final week of our Uncommon series and kind of here's where we've been throughout this series. The Apostle Paul wrote to his young protege, Timothy, and he said, hey, hey, Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youth. When you think about the lifestyle that you live, people shouldn't look down on you and think, man, he's young and needs to get his stuff together. But instead, you should set an example for all the believers. The lifestyle that you should live uh, should be one that other people would want to imitate. And he said, in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, and your purity. Now, one of the things that we said in this series that's really, really important for us is that when you think of Christianity, you should not think that what I've just done for you or we've done over the last five weeks is lay some more do's and don'ts on you. Right, careful, don't say those kind of words. Make sure you do. Like, that's not what Christianity is at all. As a matter of fact, if that's how you think about your faith in Christ, if that's how you think about Christianity, it is going to be empty and it's going to be miserable. But rather for us, when, as if believers in Jesus Christ, we're not here for do's and don'ts so much as we are. We are here because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. If, if you don't know much of my story, uh, I am a guy who had every chance to get it right. I was actually raised in this church. I was baptized here as a kid. I had wonderful people who poured into my life. My parents loved God. They served God. I had great teachers and mentors. And I mean, people poured into me in more ways than I could count. I was the guy who had every chance to get it right. And I still blew it. And I blew it in ways that I swore to myself I never would. It kind of culminated uh, one day when I, God in his grace revealed to me like, hey, you just had a conversation, an inappropriate conversation with a woman who's not your wife. And that's completely unacceptable. And, and like this mirage that I'd made of my, of my life where I began to believe about myself that I was somehow good, uh, in the midst of that, that evaporated. And I, I realized that I was in no way good. What I had not done with my life was live a good enough life in order to earn my way into God's favor. I hadn't been all that good. I hadn't avoided enough of the, the don'ts and done enough of the do's. Like I had literally blown it my entire life. And somehow I convinced myself that I was good enough before God until that moment. But when you do things you swore you would never do, when you sin in ways that you're like, oh, that's for other people, and it is in that moment that you recognize just how much you need a Savior. And in my moment of greatest sin, my moment of greatest disappointment with my life, what I found was that God was there. And God didn't just like accept me, kind of like, all right, you're like B team. But instead, God loved me. I honestly never knew the depth of God's grace until I understood the depth of my own sin. And so when we think about this series, when we think about encouraging you in your speech and in your conduct, your love, your faith, your purity, what we're not doing is giving you do's and don'ts. But rather, what we are encouraging you to do is to do unto others as Christ has done to you. We see that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what the apostle Apostle Paul says. He says, therefore, um, be imitators of God as beloved children. Here's what I want you to know. If you are here today uh, and, and you're, you're in this room, uh, Christ loves you. When he looks at you, he doesn't think you're a disappointment. He doesn't think you're a failure. He's not waiting on you to clean yourself up or get your act together. You are like a beloved child before God. Now, sometimes my kids do things, uh, they're, they're not what I hope for. I mean, it's honestly sometimes like, I cannot believe you just made that decision. My son had a brand new pair of shorts that he painted in the other day, and it's like, what were you thinking? You know, like things will ultimately disappoint you, parents, and yet there's not a moment that one of my children steps outside of my love. There's not a moment that I wouldn't lay down my life for them. And in the same way, that's how God feels about you. You are loved by God. You with your sin, with the things you've done well, your gifts, your aptitudes, your abilities, God loves you. And to be honest with you, like me, you know, we didn't deserve that. All we brought to the table in our relationship with God was our, our sin, right? And yet God has lavished his love on us. If you don't know the story of the gospel, it's the story that God looked down on the earth that was really in, in a great deal of sin and brokenness. And God chose to step into that sin and brokenness. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. He came and he lived a perfect life here. And he did so that he ultimately might go to the cross where he was crucified to die the death that you and I deserved. 
that there on the cross, for those of us who would stop trusting in our own ability to, to do the right things and avoid the wrong things, that we'd stop trusting in our righteousness, but instead those of us who would cry out in faith to Jesus Christ to save us, what God did was he took all of our sin and he placed it on Jesus. And he took that perfect righteous life of Christ and he credited that to us. So you and I, we can have a relationship with God once again. We can know him and we can walk in the abundant life that he's given us. And so the apostle Paul is like, hey, therefore, beloved children, I want you to imitate God. Remember what Jesus did for you? Man, he found you when you had nothing to offer but your sin. And he saved you. He laid down his life for you. Now to the people of God, you who claim to be the church of Jesus Christ, disciples of his, I want you to do unto others as he has done unto you. He says this, he says, As beloved children, verse 2, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. The reason that we conduct ourselves in this manner is not to earn favor with God. Uh, we do this because of the favor that God has already shown us. It's an act of worship before God. And we also know that God, who created the world, by the way, he knows better than we know. Like he understands this world better than we understand this world. And we know that as we walk in obedience to him, we are living the most productive, most joyful, uh, the best possible life that we can live is the one lived in the most utmost of obedience before God. And so um, this is kind of... Um, I don't know, a little bit selfish, right? Obedience to God, it's a little bit selfish. We're thinking about knowing this is the best way that I could possibly live. I'm going to live this life as worship before God. Now, here's what I want to do for us today. Uh, we're not going to do a new, we've done speech, love, conduct, faith, purity, the whole bit. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about the environments in which we have been called to live that out. Now, just to be clear, you're called to live this out, loving other people as Christ has loved you in every single environment you will ever set your foot into. However, I want to talk about some today that the Apostle Paul points out in Ephesians chapter 5, and somewhere it can be rather difficult to, to live this out. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. We're going to start with marriage. Now, if you're here today and you're married, you probably have had the recognition that I had. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I would have told you that I was kind of a selfless person, uh, that I didn't have any weird quirks, that, that really I was kind of easy to get along with and life should go really well. Uh, and then I got married and my wife did not fold the towels properly. And there were lots of things that I began to realize about myself that I wasn't nearly as easygoing as I thought. I wasn't nearly as easy to live with as I thought I was. Marriage is one of those environments that God uses to, um, to sanctify us, to, to help us to realize that we need to be more like Christ and, and less like ourselves. So here's what the Apostle Paul says. Here's how you live this uncommon life in the midst of your marriage. Now, he's going to start with the wives here. So ladies, here's, here's what God says to you through the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And we'll just stop there for a minute. Now, what the Apostle Paul did not say is, wives, be subject to your own husbands because they deserve it. He didn't say, wives, be subject to your own husbands because they're awesome, because they never make mistakes, because they're so responsible, because you can trust them and everything. That's not what he said. He said, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Matter of fact, your husband does not deserve this. But, what we're doing here in this marriage relationship is we're doing unto one another as Christ has done unto us. And so, wives, you look at your husband who may not deserve it, and you're reminded of the unconditional love that God showed to you. When we didn't necessarily deserve God to love us, and all we brought to the table was sin, God chose to offer his own life for us. God in the flesh and the person of Jesus Christ died that we might have abundant life. And so the apostle Paul's like, hey, wives, here's how you live this out in the midst of your marriage. You give yourself up for your husband in, the way, in this way. You unconditionally and sacrificially love him in this way. And so he goes on and says, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Now, uh, we've done a deep dive on the Greek here. This word, uh, uh, Greek word for everything, it literally means everything, y'all. That means, wives, that you don't hold anything back from your husbands. Like, you give yourself to them fully in every single way. That's what Jesus did for us, right? 
And even where your husband isn't worthy, Jesus Christ is. This is worship before a holy God. And for whatever reason, God in his wisdom said, this is what is best. This is what's best for you. It's what's best for your marriage. It's what's best for your family. It's what's best for our culture. I will not pretend to be able to tell you why this is true. I can only tell you that this is what God's word teaches us. Now, to be really clear, subjection here, uh, this isn't like slavery. This doesn't mean that wives don't have opinions. It doesn't mean that you aren't gifted. That it, it also, I want to be really clear, you were made in the image of God. You are deeply loved by God. You were given all the gifts, talents, and abilities that you have been given on purpose. And so what this doesn't mean, ladies, is that you don't contribute. You don't have a voice. Like your opinions aren't valid. That's not true at all. What this means, as a matter of fact, this Greek verb for what you do in, in subjecting yourself to your husband, it's actually a, a passive verb, which means that you respond to someone else's action. That what you were created to do in this marriage environment, the way that you were created to image Christ, is that you would follow your husband as he begins to lead. Now, you help. Uh, God looked at Adam and he was alone. I mean, he, he, he talked about like bugs, like, like ticks and mosquitoes. And he's like, oh, creation is good. But then he sees Adam alone. He's like, it's not good. For a man to be alone, your husband needs you. He needs your perspectives. He needs your opinions. Your children will live longer if you will speak up, right? Husbands are not complete in and of themselves. They, like God has given us wives for a purpose. However, God has said that for you ladies, his role is to lead and yours is to follow. And so you, you hash it out. You, you have the, the conversations, the discussions, and then you follow your husband in the same way that the church ought to follow the leadership of Jesus Christ. And again, your husband may not be worth it, but this is an act of worship before God where you are doing unto your husband as Christ has done unto you. Now, I want to be really clear here. Um, this is worship. This is before God. God is the supreme authority in our lives, in our marriage, in every single environment. And so um, if your husband leads you into sin, you should not follow him there. That's not loving. That is not the will of God for you. That's not worship. And even more so, if you find yourself in an abusive or an unsafe uh, environment, relationship with your spouse, uh, you don't have to endure that on his behalf. That's not love and that's not worship before God. As a matter of fact, if that is true for you, uh, you can let somebody know before you leave. You can send an email. You can make a phone call. And this church will fight for you. This church will take care of you. Like, we don't think that's appropriate in any way. However... If you're in a Christian marriage and it's not abusive and it's not unsafe, this is how God has called you to picture Christ to your husband, that you would give yourself up for him in this way. Now, uh, husbands, if you just elbowed your wives, guess what? You get yours now. Paul didn't stop there, and he's about to unload on the husbands. Women only got three verses. Men, you get like double that, okay? So here we go in verse 25. He's like, here's what it looks like in marriage. The wife gives herself up um, in submission to her husband. She's going to follow his leadership. And so here we are, husbands, in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, what did God hold back from the church? Nothing. Jesus Christ gave even his own life in pursuit of the church in order to save the church. God held nothing back from us. And men... This means you hold nothing back from your wives. Sometimes in the context of like marriage counseling, you, you, like we talk about this covenant where you both say, it's, it's I do, I'm in, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to love you in this way. And people are looking at each other, husband and wife, like who's going to go first? Well, men, I'll tell you the answer to that question. You do. The love of Jesus Christ was this initiating love where he looked down at the brokenness of this world and he's the one who chose to initiate that. We love God because he first loved us men. You were created to lead. You were created to go first. As a matter of fact, whereas the women had a passive verb, you're given an imperative command, like love your wives as Christ loved the church. It goes on so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Will y'all afford me a little bit of a nerd moment? Uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but I was going to be a veterinarian uh, before God called me into ministry. And so I'm at Oklahoma State. I'm in an applied nutrition class, and I stink and loved it. it. It's unbelievable, like, how precise animal nutrition is. And so we would formulate rations. I know, it sounds ridiculous, but I loved it. Anyway, so we're formulating rations, and it, like, down to, like, the most, I don't know, obscure micronutrients that that cow or that pig might need. It's embarrassing to talk about this, but regardless, like, and, and I, I loved, like, you could, you, you could like design a ration that had everything that that animal needed to grow and to thrive and to flourish and to reproduce and be what you needed that animal to be. And so you could, you could like formulate this ration and then some of the pieces are, are readily available. Some of the parts of the ration, it's easy to get protein in a diet. That's not very hard. Some uh, micronutrients are much harder to find and they can be very, very costly. Men. When you think about your relationship with your wife, some facets are going to come easily to you. And some are going to be very, very costly. As you seek to nourish and to cherish your wife, this will be sacrificial. Some days your wife's not going to deserve it. But again, we look back to Christ, love her as Christ has loved us. He loved us when we didn't deserve it. He sacrificed his own life. He died a brutal death on the cross on our behalf. And he's like, husbands, that's what you do for your wife. Man, you love her and lead her. Like you take charge and you, you get out in front in your family. You, you care for her. You provide for her. You organize a budget in your home. You act like a man and not like a child, right? You're in the front. You teach her and your family what it means to follow after Jesus Christ. You set right priorities in your home. And you speak the gospel over your wife and over your family. If you, men, I want you to hear this. If you are not leading, you are not loving your wife or worshiping God well. Not in your role as a husband. You are intended to be up front. Here's what happens in American culture. First of all, um, men are often devalued. It happens all the time. Watch any television show. The guy is always the idiot. He like doesn't know anything. He can't seem to hardly function as a person apart from his wife. That's the message that culture has told us about men. However, we're not called to live according to culture, right? Uh, Also, for ladies, you're the smart ones. You're supposed to lead. You're supposed to be strong. You're never supposed to submit. You're supposed to, you know, fight for your rights the whole bit. But in the church of Jesus Christ, our lives are called to be uncommon, unique in this world where instead of fighting for our stuff, for our rights, for our power, for our control, we give ourselves up for each other and we love one another as Christ has loved us. So men... Even though culture says you can't, you recognize who you are in Jesus Christ and what you've been called to do, and you lovingly lead your wife to know Jesus Christ. You pray with her. You open the word with her. You lead, or you're not loving your wife well. So the first environment that Paul talks about, hey, here's how you imitate Christ, is that in our marriage, but he's not done. Young people, uh, if you're a child in this room, which is true really of all of us, but especially if you're a young person, if you skip down to uh, chapter 6 here, it says, children, chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, what, what the apostle Paul doesn't say here is that parents are always right. I'm not always right as a dad. I I, I make mistakes. I don't always pay the best attention. I don't always make the best decisions. But what the Apostle Paul would say for you, if you're a child in this room, uh, you need to know, by the way, that you're not the church of tomorrow. You're not like the B team, the sophomore that someday will be a senior and you get to live for the Lord. Those students this morning evidence that you are the church of Jesus Christ today. It is, it is the call upon your life to live this uncommon life here in the world to represent Jesus Christ. Well, you do that. By obeying your parents. And even when your parents don't deserve it, even when they seem pretty unreasonable or so old-fashioned or out of touch, you look to Jesus Christ, the one who loved you and gave himself up for you. And if your parents aren't worthy of obedience, you obey on behalf of Christ. But then he takes it a step further because it's not just obedience. It goes a step beyond that. In verse 2 he says, Honor 
your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live a long life on the earth. Anyone, if you're here, you did it, right? Your parents told you to do something and you turn around and under your breath, you're rolling your eyes so hard, like you're, you're muttering things. You go slam the door in your bedroom. You're like, they don't understand anything, right? Um, what the Apostle Paul says that we should do in order to image Christ or be imitators of God as disciples of Jesus Christ. Stephen, when your parents are unreasonable, we choose to honor them. Which means it's not muttering things under your breath and rolling your eyes and talking about how dumb they are to your friends, but instead you choose to honor them in your thoughts and with your words and with your actions. And adults here, even when your parents seem a little bit unreasonable, right? They get old and a little bit cranky or cantankerous. You choose to honor them, and that pictures Christ. Even when your parents aren't worth it, even when they seem unreasonable, we look to Christ who is worthy of our worship, and we offer ourselves to our parents in this capacity. Verse 4, um, we're looking at the home. We start with marriage. Now we're looking at the home. Children, obey your parents. Verse 4, it's fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This Greek word, bring them up, is the same word for nourishment used with the wives there. That means husbands or fathers, it is your responsibility to make sure that your kids have everything they need to grow and mature in the Lord. Now, we're pretty good at this with ball, right? Like when it comes ball season, like they got the cleats. I've seen kids that are like nine years old with $400 bats. Like they got the gear, they got the glasses, they're, they're decked out. And we can see this when it comes to our physical world. But men, far more important than teaching your kid to play ball, to outfit them for their sports and all those things, is that you would nourish them and bring them up in the discipline and the admonition, the instruction of the Lord. Now, here's the thing, dads. This, this is a little bit heavy for you. But again, you are the leader of the home. God has designed it this way. What God did not intend was for you to watch Sports Center and pursue your hobbies while your wife raised your kids. And they need you. Now, when he, when he says here, don't provoke your children to anger, one of the things that is incredibly frustrating, I heard this as a youth pastor for years, is when you portray one thing publicly and another thing privately. What I'm not talking about is that I'm not saying you can't ever blow it in your household and, you know, that's unforgivable. But man, hypocrisy in the example that you set for your kids when you would call them to one standard and live another, and it provokes your children to anger and is so destructive in their lives where you come to church, we espouse certain principles, and then we leave here and we don't live those out. Provoking your children to anger, instead, we bring them up, we nourish them. Men, you cannot teach what you do not know. And we live in a day where even though we have the Bible, the Word, in printed form, it's everywhere. It's on our phone. It's, you can read it on the computer. Like, it's everywhere. And we're, we're in a day and age where people don't know the Word of God anymore. Men don't know the Word of God anymore. Like, it's our responsibility to look out for our families like to, to ward off the threats that might come. And if we don't know the Word, we can't bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. We don't know how to discipline them according to the Word of God. So men, again, an encouragement to you as you seek to imitate Christ, to lovingly lead your family, to bring your children up. And you need to know the Word. It's, it, it is imperative for us that we put aside the phone, to set aside the hobby, and we open up the Word of God and we begin to lead well in our home, both with our, our, our lips, where we would instruct our kids, and also with our lives as we set an example for them. So I've given you marriage, which is hard in and of itself to live that out as a husband, laying down your life for your wife, serving her, caring for her, a wife submitting to your husband, even when it sometimes feels unreasonable. Like, this is difficult. Kids to obey and honor your parents' fathers to bring them up is difficult. But that's not the only environments, the home, the marriage, are not the only environments in which God has called us to imitate Christ, to reflect him to the world. He goes on here, and this is going to sound a little bit unreasonable to you. Matter of fact, almost a bit harsh. Here's what he says in verse 5. He says, slaves. Now, if you hear that word with a negative connotation, you should. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross in Jerusalem, the Roman Empire is, is, is big. It's kind of the, the dominant theme of the world as we, we see it in the Scriptures. Slavery was common. 
Men were owned, they were abused, they were mistreated, they were threatened, they were sold as property. And even in the midst of that, God says to you slaves, I want you to imitate me, even to those masters who might be unreasonable. Even in the midst of this oppressive system, which often said to those slaves that they weren't, uh, they weren't on par with other people, as if they weren't made in the image of God or loved by him. Slaves, I want you to imitate me. And here's what he called them to do. He says, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart. Not because they deserve it right, but instead we obey them as to Christ. This is worship. And this is portraying Jesus Christ to a watching world. Why in the world would a slave want to honor and obey a master who mistreated them? Why in the world would this slave choose to submit to his, his, his master who wasn't good? And we're just reminded that Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, became the servant of everyone. When all we brought to the table is our sin and our rebellion, he loved us enough to die for us. So guess what? We can serve those who would be our masters. Now, this is true for slaves, but it's certainly true for us as employees who work for other people. And we're going to be diligent about what we do. We're working not for them, not for that corporation who we don't buy into all their values and agree with everything that they do. We are working as unto the Lord. And I promise you, that is uncommon in our culture. What's normal is to say, they're not paying me enough. And he's not even a good dude. I'm going to work hard when he's watching. And I'm going to slack when he's not. He goes on and says, not by way of eye service when they're watching, right, as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And this is the will of God for you, that you would do unto your master, you would do unto your employer as Christ has done to you. He gave you gifts that you do not deserve, and that's what we do. With goodwill, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And then Paul turns his attention to masters. Jesus goes to the cross. He's resurrected. The Holy Spirit comes. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. Those of you who are masters, you're over people. You're in charge of them. Like to modernize that, if you're an employer, you're a boss, you're somehow higher than someone else on the org chart, here's how you're to conduct yourself toward your fellow employees, those who are under your charge. He says, do the th same things to them. Now, what he's referencing is what he just told the slaves to do. when it says, doing the will of God from the heart. And so for those of us who are maybe a little higher on the org chart, if you're a boss, you're an owner, you're an employer, you should do to your employees as Christ has done to you. Christ served you. He gave his life for your good that you might find true life in him. And we don't use employees. We don't mistreat employees. It says to give up threatening here, knowing that their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. And we see every single person as a man or a woman or a child who is made in the image of God, who is loved by God, and we treat them as such. We do unto others as Christ has done unto us, and that is uncommon in our world. The American ethic when it comes to relationships is that of a mirror, which means we reflect back to people what they give to us. If you think I'm awesome... I think you're awesome, right? I mean, if you love me, I'm going to love you in return. You give to me, you serve me. Like, I'm all about giving you back what you've given to me. And yet the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, writing to this young man, Timothy, ah, that's not how you live. You set an example for how this ought to go. You look to Jesus Christ to see how he has loved you unconditionally and sacrificially. And that's what you reflect back to the world. Reflect Christ in every single interaction, in every single relationship. Y'all, what I, I desire for us as a church, so what's written on that sign out there, is that our church, being the church, isn't an hour a week when we gather here and sing some songs and hear someone preach. But we would be the church of Jesus Christ at every moment of every single day, reflecting to the world that what God has done to us 
that we would preach the gospel with our lips, but we'd also preach it with our lives. We would do so in our homes. We would do so in our marriages with our kids, and we would do so in the workplace. The people may come to know the God who loved them enough to die on a cross that they might find new life. Would you bow with me? Oh, God. I didn't deserve what you've done for me. God, what I deserved was punishment. What I deserved was separation. And we look to the Word, and we see that even though we deserve separation, we deserve punishment. God, you gave us grace. You've forgiven our sin. You've given us new life in you. And Lord Jesus, this, this text is ultimately, it's about us living like it. And I pray that through the power of your spirit, we would live like it. That we would be so thankful and motivated by your love for us that we would extend that same love to other people. Knowing that we didn't deserve it, we extend it to people that don't. God, help us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Help us to, to proclaim the gospel with both our lips and our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.